Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response, or welcome to the first time. I think we have a number of people who haven't uh, uh, participated before, according to the registration, but uh, everybody's welcome. This is session 87 in our now four-year running series on Libraries in Response. And today we're going to dive into artificial intelligence. And specifically, this is a special session because we're announcing the start of Project Slate, the State Libraries and Artificial Intelligence Tools Project. And uh, so that's going to be our focus today. We'll talk about that and some other stuff. So we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. We're an open consortium of uh, innovation, as we say, libraries. I'm not sure that's how you get an adjective out of innovation, but it feels better than just innovative. So that's what we say. Uh, and uh, we've been working in this area, technology, mostly communications technology and libraries for uh, the past 15 years or so. And uh, this started uh, with the pandemic and how once the libraries were all closed, what were their services? How could they deliver those services? through communications it got everybody's attention about the the need the absolute necessity of connectivity that you know, really made that made that distinction our host uh and recording the session as ever is ifla stephen weiber the head of public policy for ifla in the hague is at the controls and a longtime partner in our campaign for universal public access every community should have a connection every library and every community should have a robust connectivity uh, resource for anyone. Our sponsor is IMLS. They've come in to help us uh, with the program this year, and we're thankful for that. Started with COVID. Uh, it's still happening. We, you know, we feel, I think we feel safe, or maybe we just are paying attention to other things, but this has not gone away. It continues to mutate and just for a moment there, it's relatively, relatively uh, harmless. I mean, relatively. Uh, but we also have other crises happening concurrently. And of course, climate being the top dog on the, on the crisis list. Uh, we've seen just extraordinary experiences in the last 24 months. Uh, then we have, you know, violence breaking out, uh, not, quite yet burning the libraries, but you know, there's talk, that kind of thing. Uh, and then here's our, our new uh, player in the in the, the crisis pan uh, population, we'll call it. Uh, and what is it? You know, is it, a, is it a good thing, a bad thing? Is it a mixed thing? You know, it's technology, so it's probably both. Uh, so here's our kind of composite of uh, uh, these various crises that are all arriving at once. And the poor world is longing for the days of only having to worry about nuclear annihilation, which I remember very well. And I think it's still uh, a worry if, you, if you're looking for worries, but there are plenty to assert themselves. This, uh, we identified this, I mean, we started out talking about COVID of course, and then the other things came along, you know, was, there was the social crisis and then there was the economic crisis, the political crisis, and then the uh, other things have come along. It just seemed like a veritable cascade of crises that were just coming and hitting society. I mean, everywhere, the pandemic was everywhere. AI now is everywhere. The climate is everywhere. So it's, uh, it's a, it's an extraordinary kind of circumstance that, uh, uh, is being described as a polycrisis, which is not a new term, but it's, I mean, it's recent. I think it's uh, two, three years old. <clears throat> and describing this not as just separate events, but events that are entangled and interacting and creating more uh, that are compounding. And so this is, this is a highly co complex interactive sort of concept, but it seems to make sense. Uh, we're reacting to all these uh, psychologically, 
I think we're all still in shock from, from COVID. We're trying to adapt to normal or what we call a new normal, but it's elusive, especially when things just keep hammering away. Uh, I searched on Cascade and found that there's actually a Cascade Institute, and this is what they're focusing on. So you can find that. Um, all right. Well, with that, I am going to conclude the introduction here and welcome our partner in the project, David Lankus. Uh, the, the Slate project, David and I have been doing uh, these AI-focused sessions for several years now, and this just emerged as a natural and David had the, the presence, uh, and I certainly resonate with the, uh, the notion that the state library agencies have a special position and play a special role in the, in the library ecosystem. They're connected to basically every single facility is one click away from the state library. And they have, uh, they have obligations at the, as state agencies across state government which has an interaction with both federal and local government. So they just sit at the interaction point of a lot of interesting uh, things. And they also are the, the, the conduit for federal funds to, to the states. Uh, most of IMLS's budget, 80% of IMLS's budget goes through the state libraries. And so they play a, a special role and we're just couldn't be happier about this, this project. And so it's being led by David, and we couldn't be more glad to be a partner in the project. So David, congratulations, welcome. Tell us what this thing is all about. Thank you, Don. And it is fantastic to have um, Gigabit Libraries Network as a partner in this project, and, and particularly for making these kinds of uh, access to a large community available. And I'd just like to briefly say hello to many familiar faces on here from Stephen. Thanks once again for helping us. And I just wanted to say hi to um, Kieran. Uh, appreciate you coming in. Uh, some circle love. And we have some of our state libraries as well for the conversation. And after I give a brief over the overview, I'll introduce um, the initial team that's working on it. It will grow as the project goes on. As a launch of a project, I suppose I should be talking about how it's going to save and change the world and, you know, all this wonderful stuff. But honestly, what we're looking to do is figure things out. Artificial intelligence is a rapidly moving field. Um, most of us came, got it, sort of gained our attention over the past year with ChatGPT and the emergence of generative AI tools to create images and write texts and create soundtracks and video editing. And these days it's baked into everything. In fact, for me, the turning point was um, when we were talking in university settings and in K-12 settings about should we allow people to use AI, and I brought up PowerPoint to do a presentation, and PowerPoint was giving me AI suggestions on how to make the slides look better, and I brought up Google Documents as first Google Docs, and its first thing is click here to have, you know, I'll help you write it, and it's, it's one of those things that is being baked into everything that is ubiquitous, but what's also interesting is that AI has been ubiquitous for a long time. Um, machine um, learning and inductive algorithms, heuristic, heuristic algorithms have changed how we search the web, how we listen to music. I'm a huge Spotify fan. And the next song is very much normally AI suggested uh, that can affect people's moods. We see it in creating education and tutoring services. In the field of libraries, in within seconds, we're going to begin talking about co-pilots and AI systems helping us search and do research and find new documents. So for a long time, AI has been a significant part and really replaced more algorithmic approaches to the knowledge infrastructure that we are all part of. So we want to look at that span. And as Don mentioned, when we said, sort of, how do we look at that? We've, we've had really great conversations with all of our state library colleagues. And they're at a really interesting moment. Um, they're at an interesting moment because they're already taking on a lot of new tasks, things like rural, rural broadband, um, digital literacy, information literacy standards, and workforce development. And uh, as Don has pointed out many times, a lot of the policy development is going to happen at the state level. While there's conversations at the federal level, our federal uh, legislative system is not 
busy, busy, busy passing laws right now. Uh, we do have some executive orders that we need to look at, but a lot of this is going to happen at the state level. So this is why when we are looking at sort of what AI, what its challenges and opportunities and impacts are, why we worked around the state library. So I'm going to show pretty slides and then we'll be done for a moment. But um, so today we're beginning the um, state libraries and AI technology overview. We've been working up to it for about two or three months now, but today's our official kickoff date. So what is our goal? Our goal is to better equip state library agencies to proactively respond to opportunities and perils in AI. This is a, one of those things that can we get not just ahead of this, but can we find opportunities? Can we find um, challenges? And how is this going to work at the state level? Um, so that's our one of our goals. Another goal is to provide insight and participant specific ideas for projects and applications. There is an old joke that I use way too often, but I'm going to do it again, which is once you know one state library, you know one state library. They're all very different. In fact, in many ways, I think they're a great exemplar of how libraries adapt to and change to local settings, even if that location is an entire state or territory. And so simply going in and talking amongst state libraries and saying this is the way or the suggestion doesn't make sense. Just like I believe if we say the same thing for libraries, just before we started recording the discussion about using smart speakers and such and reference functions and such, does that make sense in your library, in your setting? And it may be different across that. So while there are certainly many ideas that we can come up with on um, AI training and awareness, where state libraries and help local libraries, public libraries, school libraries, academic libraries, provide a training and training sessions, creating public forums, um, building an AI business development center. Not every state library, but many state libraries have workforce development as a key factor in what they're doing. And so wouldn't it be interesting to help small businesses figure out how to utilize or how to deal with the impacts of artificial intelligence? Updating information literacy standards. Several of our libraries, Delaware in particular, but also New Jersey, have talked about the idea of digital literacy standards for schools, digital literacy standards for librarians and certification processes. What do people need to know about this? Um, what do need, people need to be able, what do librarians as professionals seeking to improve their communities and prepare their communities, what do they need to know? Uh, and finally, things like library supported cohorts. Can we create different ways of coordination, uh, work with community colleges and universities and businesses and set up mentoring programs? All of these are ideas, but they're not necessarily the right idea for every state library or every individual library. And so we want to be able to ground those and connect those into strategic initiatives within those state library contexts. Ultimately, we're looking to better position state library agencies in a growing effort to the AI, workforce development, and uh, their own outreach and support missions. Um, how are we going to do this? Great questions. Um, we're doing this as a working group of something called CIRCLE. CIRCLE is the Collaborative Institute for Rural Communities and Librarianship. And yes, we started with CIRCLE and then figured out what the words meant. But uh, we've always, we're, it's, a, it's a think tank by, for, and with rural librarians and rural libraries. It brings in partners, including already state libraries, um, State Library of Colorado as one example, um, New York, um, and scholars and universities to come in and discover what are the issues that rural libraries are dealing with and then take those issues and figure out if we can help build capacity to support local initiatives and local views on what we do. Ultimately, our method for this is informed conversation. Uh, what we want to do is bring in agencies where we bring in through surveys and interviews, bring in experts, people who are developing this thing, people who are commercializing this, people who are fighting this. Um, talk to different stakeholders and then, of course, look through the literature and other resources and talk to policy experts so that as the state libraries are having a conversation about what is our strategic role, what is our purpose, how are we going to move ahead, that conversation doesn't start from ground one going, I don't know, I tried chat GPT yesterday. What do you think? Or some people have tried it and have um, staff expertise. Some have very small staffs. 
and they don't have time to take on yet another test. And so we want to inform the conversation. So at the end of the six month process, state librarians and state libraries can make some strategic priority decisions based on what's going on in the world. And even though it's rapidly changing, we'll at least have a foundation for that conversation. One of the methods that we're really excited about uh, is the AI petting zoo, right? We want to go in and try this, right? So we're not just sort of looking and reading and thinking secondhand. We wanna get our hands dirty. We wanna try paid level services. If for example, you're interested in image production and generative AI, and you wanna try Mid Journey, which is one of the most popular versions, these days you've gotta to pay to get into it. ChatGPT that many people have tried has a paid tier that gets you more current, more recent, and more in-depth information. In image creation, allows you to do iterations, different features. The ability to create your own, what they call GPTs, which are your own chatbots, where you can upload your own documents, your own materials, your own policies and resources, and create a AI system specifically geared to your work it requires a license to do it. If you want to embed those within your system, so it's another service that you may try, you got to pay to get there. So we want to go ahead and be able to look behind the paywall and see what the capabilities are. Product demonstrations. If those interested, for example, supporting uh, research libraries and supporting K-12 research, there are now increasingly a number of AI products from AI generated notebooks to AI systems that can um, go out and scan existing open educational resources and open, um, open access publications and bring those materials in where you can quickly scan them, talk to them, ask questions about them. We wanna be able to see what these systems look like so that once again, moving ahead, state libraries, can have conversations with vendors, can talk about sources they may bring in. Um, as an example, many state libraries do statewide database licensing. In Texas, we have a number of databases that we license for public library use and specific subsets for school use. We know those vendors are probably currently cooking up and thinking about what AI interfaces may look like. And we know that there are potential issues. We wanna be able to go to the vendor communities and say, hey, we are a customer here, but we need you to think this way about those tools. We need to be able to implement these tools. We need to avoid these problems, these ethical issues, these copyright issues. Because ultimately, until you play with them, you don't necessarily get a sense of exactly what their capabilities are. Take image generation. AI image generations can be used for creative images. They can be used for fantastical images that we see on a regular basis but they can also be able to use produce some rather creepy, authentically human versions of people. All of these images, all of them are AI generated. And as we begin to use them and look at them, talking to rural libraries, for example, where they can use it to produce marketing material, where they can use it to produce copy, where they can use it to produce different things, what do they need to know in that field and that area? So, we're going to do this by tying to strategic priorities because frankly, we could get lost in playing with these things all day and there are new articles popping up every second and there's new movements, but we wanna create the six month platform and the, the sort of goal post or stake in the sand that we're gonna tile this work to are these strategic priorities. For some of these state libraries, that will be their LSTA plan. As Don had mentioned that, um, federal funding goes through something called the Library Services Technology Act. And as part of that, every five years, state libraries have to produce a strategic plan. These are the areas that we're going to um, work toward. The state library agencies themselves may have a strategic plan, or they may be part of or aligned to a larger state plan. And so we want to make sure that when the recommendations go back to these state libraries, they are useful. Uh, and applicable very rapidly and unique to each participant, just as each state library is unique. The way this is happening is very much through the, the generosity and support of state library agencies. We have 14 of them. Each has contributed $10,000 to making this six month project starting today, where we'll be developing these strategic connections. We'll be doing an instruction we're hoping to do less and less of sort of our own instruction and more and more of providing guidance to really good workshops, tutorials, and materials on the web. But where there's a gap, particularly as it applies to state library staff or libraries in general, we'll be producing those contents. Briefings, in a moment, you're gonna hear from 
Riley about different briefings he's been producing, things like, it turns out there are lots of ways to define AI. Which one, what's the priority, what makes sense, how do we use it? And ultimately through community conversations. One of the things I'm really excited about is uh, a former classmate of mine, but a working illustrator, uh, Kelly Light, who's published several children's books and is a day-to-day a -day illustrator making her living, has real interest and a real solid opinions about generative AI and image generation, its impact on labor and workforce, its impact on the, the creative process itself. Those are voices that we wanna bring up in these conversations. So it's not just librarians talking to ourselves and it's not just technology people who love what technology can do, but we talk about its impact in creative forces, in workforce development, in education, et cetera. So this is what we're here to talk about. This is the overview. And so what I'm gonna do for a moment is I'm going to um, stop these slides and briefly introduce uh, the team that will be helping Don and I work on this for the next six months. If that's all right. Um, so heading up really our assessment and whenever I talk libraries and strategy, my go-to expert in the universe is Kim Silk. Uh, Kim is, a, uh, is the lead consultant for BrightSale um, Research and has done work in public libraries, academic libraries, and in LSTA evaluation. So, hey, Kim, say hi. <laughs> hey, y'all. Nice to see everyone. Good to see those familiar faces. Um, also on the team, uh, I'm going to hold back, but uh, Rachel, uh, Rachel Dietsch, who is not available today, but she is helping coordinate the larger circle project. So uh, my state library colleagues and my circle colleagues will be hearing, hearing from Rachel soon. She comes from her background actually in startups and data management, uh, working on workflows and work processes, and is brilliant at um, working through these systems. Um, Leela Green will be helping us as well. I saw Leela earlier. Uh, Leela is uh, a graduate student in library science with a large um, background and experience in areas of intellectual freedom, but will be helping us on areas of just how to come up to speed, education, learning processes, a sort of um, view into this material that keeps us honest. Leela, do you want to say hello briefly? Hello. It's nice to meet everybody. I'm thrilled to be on the project and um, especially as somebody who lives in a rural community to be able to give a rural perspective on these things. And that's a that's an excellent point. Why are we talking about state libraries? Will this project be only about rural communities? And the answer is no, it's looking at state libraries, but we will ensure that rural communities have a specific glance and look at. We know, for example, for many of our partners, such as Iowa, um, such as um, that they have a large rural community and they want to have that voice heard. So it's not going to be exclusively rural, but we're gonna guarantee that our rural peeps and our rural concepts are brought into this. I'm looking at Diane briefly to make sure that she has taught me well. So we'll, we'll make sure that voice is there. Um, I'm gonna introduce our tech lead at this point. Her background is in technology and computer science. She's gonna be able to look at some of the background and implementation issues, as well as keeping us online and on the web. Kadili, could you say hello? Oh, I have a mute. Or rather, I can't hear you if you're unmuted. I don't. All right. Don't so there's Kadili's waving hi. <laughs> Thank you very much. And finally, um, and like I say, the team will be growing. But finally, uh, I want to introduce Riley Lankus. Um, the last name is unfortunate in his place. But uh, Riley uh, has a background in foreign affairs and policy development. He's a recent graduate of the University of College Dublin foreign affairs program. Um, has done work with the United Nations on information, information literacy issues, and is particularly bringing an interest around the notion of corrosive AI, how AI can be used to undermine trust in democratic institutions at a pretty rapid pace. Things like having Joe Biden's voice be used um, in some disinformation campaigns and such, and he's getting this started off. So I'm going to introduce Riley, and then Donna, I, I'm going to hand it back to you. So Riley, can you please say uh, hello? You, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, well, I, we wanted to take a pause and do some questions here before Riley yeah. uh, talks about definition. Okay. So Riley, Riley, say hello. Introduce yourself. Anyway. 
Yeah, I'll just introduce myself real quick. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Very good to be here and, and looking forward to working with you all and saying a little more in a bit. Great. Okay. Uh, anyone raise your hand or I guess just say something. I don't know that we're tightly controlling who has mic power. Uh, there's quite a few entries in the chat. Anybody want to vocalize any of that? Let's see. Let me take a look at some of these. Let's see. Interested in leveraging AI to create more accessible environment for people who wish to find information on e resource providing state. Absolutely. One of the things that that I think every technology comes with the good news, bad news. But in terms of the upside and the good news, the idea of automatic image description, the idea of summarization of materials, the ability to take images and turn it into text. We're seeing a lot of uh, new tools and opportunities to create accessibility uh, in a digital environment. And so that's something that we absolutely have to pay attention to. So I appreciate that. Um, if AI uh, writes a paper, does it stores it for use? Is it original work by the author, therefore copyrighted? There actually is some initial judgments and legislation on this more coming. The initial uh, ruling by the Copyright Office and upheld an initial court is that AI generated material is not a product of human agency and therefore is not cannot be copyrighted. As I said, those laws are going to be um, challenged in a bit because there's a whole issue from just taking the legal issues from copyright, can it be? And, and your point, I like how you phrased that question because, but if I co-wrote it, et cetera, um, to the idea of our places like ChatGPT and large language models that built their image generation capabilities coming from basically scraping the web for every piece of text and every image they could find without necessarily asking permission. Well, no, without asking permission ahead of time to make that happen. I see Kim, one second. Um, the question is, did they produce something that is a derivative product or something that is a new use to the product? And there are currently multiple lawsuits, one from the New York Times and one from a group of publishers and significant authors, including Amy Schumer and such. Kim, do you want to jump in? Just wanted to uh, address a fantastic question that my um, friend and colleague, Martha Curldew, has brought up in the chat about how do we know when um, our project is successful? What are our indicators for success? And a uh, brilliant question. Thank you, Martha, for uh, um, bringing up one of my favorite topics. Um, this is very much an exploratory project. Um, I'm not sure if we know where the destination is at this point, but I can assure you that um, when it comes to looking at indicators that we should keep going with this project, really that is gonna be feedback from the community of stakeholders and people in, involved in this project, um, specifically, of course, the 14 state libraries who have invested in this project, um, looking to them for what it is that would really help them move their needles forward. And so it's really um, going to be very much community feedback that we're looking at as, as indicators to keep moving forward. Yeah, and, and Chris, you built on that talking about specific deliverables. So, one, we're going to be doing, um, we'll be doing briefings. Um, all the materials that come through this are publicly accessible. So obviously while we're hearing to, listening to and having a conversation among uh, the stakeholders, including other circle stakeholders, the output of the products are gonna be widely available in terms of the briefings, which you'll hear about in a moment. Um, but yes, the idea is directly usable in the sense of a set of recommendations tied to the strategies that they identify as top priorities um, as options. Also hoping that when they begin to make decisions about whether they're going to implement these recommendations, they have informed. So a lot of the output is informed staff, people who can, um, some uh, state libraries, small, they're already overtaxed. And so they're going to be waiting for sort of the inputs and the periodics. We know some are going to be directly spending pretty much every day with us in a Slack working group talking about how do we try this. Stacey Aldridge uh, at the uh, State Library of Hawaii put it beautifully. The three areas, and I'm, I'm using my terms, but her ideas, 
Um, the three areas that we want to talk about are sort of dreaming, dreading, and destroying. Um, what are the dreams? How can we use AI to better position libraries, state libraries, but all libraries in um, an AI future? Uh, dread, what are the potential downfalls, ethical issues, what's going to stop things? And destroying is really breaking. How are we going to try these and see what their edges are, where they can go, what are the problems from hallucinations to what have you? Sorry, Don, I, I jumped in. No, no, that's great. Uh, that's a great uh, illumination of, of kind of the challenge, I suppose. Uh, the the variance of the individual states participating looks a whole lot like the variance of individual libraries. It's all over the place. And so the the needs and the desires of these different agencies uh, will determine a lot of what the, the outcomes, so-called outcomes are. This is a road we all need to be on. It, this is an environmental change. And so it's not, it's not isolated like we're trying to learn to play tennis. This is like we're trying to learn what's the new uh, the new environment that we're all now operating in, because it's this, of course, is a discussion. Of, I mean, how big of a deal is this? Is this is this another Y two K or you know what's is it is it a bubble? Is it a real uh, effective shift in humanity? This this tool that's arrived is it it's really seems different than just the web, which was a which changed everything, but we don't know, and we're we're trying to we're trying to discover what this is. Uh, Riley's going to give us some definitions; these are starting points, but we don't. We're trying to uh, we're trying to figure out what what approach, uh, either as individuals or as institutions or as enterprises, and so strategic thinking is. Um, what I believe we're really trying to generate here uh, in, in, uh, in the context of the project. So next month, we're gonna be doing a, another session. Uh, the Toronto Public Library is gonna come in. They've been leading in this stuff for a long time. They're doing a lot of, a lot of interesting things with AI. And I asked them, well, okay, do you have a strategy for AI? And they go, mm, no, we don't. We're just doing kind of everything ad hoc. Well, yeah, I can appreciate that, but uh, is that the best way to go at this? And this pressure for a strategic approach is kind of being imposed. Uh, so David mentioned the federal executive order that Biden put out. Well, so all the agencies across the federal government now have to, are being requested, if not ordered, to align their practices with these principles. And that's causing a lot of disruption uh, and this is also happening at the state level. I think there are 21 states already that have passed regulations or executive orders for the agencies across the states to respond. So this is just coming. People are trying to figure it out, and they're going to be looking to librarians for answers. David, you gave a, 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 a kind of a brilliant forecast of why this was a special event for librarians as distinct from you know, food service or, uh, you know, uh, other kind of industries. What What is it that, that you see makes this a special circumstance for, li for the librarianship uh, field? Well, I think the opportunity here is, I mean, the, there are opportunities. One, this is, this is very much about the knowledge infrastructure that we're a part of, right? How people come to learn about themselves, the place, the meaning, the tasks that they're being part of. This is core to it because it's already changing what we're doing. Um, but the other opportunity um, that I think that I want to bring up really quickly is that we can help people tell their stories, right? That people who may not feel they're good writers or good artists or good video or what have you, don't like their own voice. These technologies can be used to, to unleash and unveil those stories to many people. We have to ensure as librarians that that's done ethically, that that's done in a representative way, that that does not continue marginalization of communities and such. But to me, one of the really important issues that we talk about, um, you know, the, the analogy is that this is 1997 all over again, and many of you may not remember it, but 1997 began with why did Pepsi just put a URL on its can? And uh, what is this internet thing? And ended with, we're all going on the internet. What if it's internet first and how we're thinking and sort of exploded from there. And are we at that point now? 
But the to me, one of the questions we're going to be looking at to me is the most important, which is around this concept of are these technologies going to be used to continue to isolate and allow people to separate from social connection, just as we saw social media do, because the same players that are building AI tools are the same ones who built those um, social media tools that substituted anger and, 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 and spending time on systems for connection in society controversy over connection. And so we need to make sure that we as librarians with the best and sort of social good are part of that conversation so that we can look at this the technology that potentially connects people. Don, I'm not sure I got to, to the, the point that you wanted me to. <laughs> yes, you did. It, it, it just seems to me that, it, that this particular phenomenon is resonating in a special way with the world of libraries. That, it feels like this is our space. This is what we do. We uh, we help people cope with information and sort information from one thing to another. So it, it almost seems kind of personal. I, I, I'm not, of course, a librarian, but it's just the feeling that I get from how the really the strong reactions that, that we're having from the field. And this is this has been our most popular topic since we started. Uh, AI. More people have turned up for the our AI sessions than the other ones. So, uh, I just been, wanted to. to been, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, just to say, it's been interesting that the response to AI over the past year has been generally positive among librarians. In other words, it's it usually major technology shifts, and we've gone through many, many, many in a relatively short time. Are first addressed with suspicion and dread about whether they're going to be replaced. And while certainly our partners in the publishing community and some of the academic community are having that dread, by and large librarians, while they're worried about the workload that's going to install, have been positive about how we can use this and how this is going to be helpful in our task and not replacing our tasks. Yeah. Yeah, and I think part of that is that if this, and I'm going to touch on literacy here in a moment, but if this in, is in fact a new communication vehicle, a new type of uh, literacy, people look to the libraries for help in developing those skills. And uh, that's, of course, a tradition that's been going on. Uh, what I did want to, uh, there are some interesting things in the chat, David, you might want to address, but there was one thing I wanted to add or reemphasize that was mentioned earlier uh, about the state agencies. So systems like Toronto and New York Public I mean, they, they're, they're loaded re with resources. They've got a lot of brilliant people and big IT staff and you know, special projects, personnel. Uh, this is just not true in, in smaller communities. And so, which means of course, it's not as well true in smaller community libraries. libraries. And so this is one of the things that state libraries are especially do is provide support to the smaller rural uh, libraries in their communities. <clears throat> the the big systems, I don't think they look so much to the state agencies for guidance, uh, but the small ones do. And and this, of course, is another uh, uh, another field where that's uh, where that's relevant. And it's it's one of the phenomena that has been kind of part of the social political crisis in the country or, or everywhere is the difference in opportunity or resources available to people that are in dense urban areas versus the ones that are in more remote areas. This is why we have a connectivity gap. This is why there's so many types of gap because basic infrastructure economics says the farther you are away from the core of any network, the farther, I mean, the, the, the more expensive it is to deliver services to you. And so they just stop somewhere. And broadband is of course a great example of that. Uh, it's not considered, uh, it's not believed, it's not embraced as an actual essential service like electricity or water. And so the principles of universal service have not been applied to broadband, for example. And so that means we've got a lot of small towns that are not connected. That means all the young people are leaving town and none of the businesses are moving in. And these, these places are, are drying up and blowing away. So it's for us, it's kind of an obligation that this, if something is an essential service, that everybody should have affordable access to it. And this is yet another 
example of that. And to the extent that the project and the state agencies can support the needs of these smaller communities, it will be a super plus. Uh, uh, Riley, you've got your hand up. Did you want to say something about that or is it just, you just hand no. up? If we have a minute, um, I'd like to, to provide another answer to your original question about, you know, why is this so important for libraries in particular? Um, as I said earlier, my background is in politics here. And so of those three groups, Dream, Doom, and Destroy, obviously I come from the Doom group. Um, but if I may be permitted to dream for a moment, um, I think libraries offer a lot of unique ability to solve problems connected to AI. One of those that I've been I've been doing research on is this idea of uh, corrosive AI, and in short, that is the idea that you know there's been predictions going around that AI, particularly generative AI, is going to damage trust. Uh, the word all of these papers in my realm, at least, love to use is erode. It's going to you know be the slow damaging of trust um, because people won't know what's real because people won't be able to tell what's generated, and what's not. Um, the novel prediction with corrosive AI is that's not going to be a slow process. It's going to be very, very quick. Um, this is based on some research I did a few months ago and has, has in many ways been vindicated over the last few months. Um, one of the things we were predicting was um, AI scandals were going to be this big deal. And a week and a half ago, we saw uh, mass robocalls go out in the state of New Hampshire at the primary, um, encouraging voters not to vote in the AI generated voice of President Joe Biden. Um, so we can see this is this is already an issue, but like I said, libraries, I think, are very uniquely equipped to solve this. Um, why AI is so corrosive to trust, particularly in politics and our political institutions, has to do with partially the business model, that it's open access, but also rapidly deployed, um, partially because it damages trust in video and images as a medium. But the main point is that it really empowers disinformation. Um, the ability to generate this content very, very quickly, the ability for anyone with internet access to go ahead and alter video, alter images, create audio, um, using models of people's voices to make them say things they never said, is going to be, and indeed already is, a really big issue. We can see this potentially leading to political scandals, which are going to damage trust, not in individual people alone, but in the institutions of our democracy themselves. And this is somewhere libraries can really contribute. Information literacy is, you know, one of the solutions to this, allowing people to understand what's real, what is AI generated, even what these models are capable of, will do a lot towards um, helping people understand disinformation, particularly when it's AI generated and be able to identify it. This is also why we bring up that petting zoo um, not just for the purposes of, of libraries being able to use these models for themselves, but to understand what's out there, what people are going to be encountering and the issues that come with it. Um, and I think it's really good that we're working with states here because every state is going to be different, dealing with different issues politically, um, that reality and, and being able to work with individual ones um, to solve these information issues, because largely this is going to be an information issue and an issue of trust. And as we like to throw around, libraries are kind of the last trusted public institution. It's, it is just an extraordinarily uh, wonderful point and, and a, it's a place to dream and a hope. And it's why people turn to libraries because they are, they do trust them. And, and trust is, you know, falling away and libraries are just rising up by comparison to all the other institutions. <laughs> so this is seems to be an even greater asset today than it's ever been for libraries in this world of, you know, where AI is spawning stuff on its own seeming volition, uh, misinformation, not much less being a, a, a tool of uh, malefactors. Uh, but uh, this, this whole area of ethics is another area that we're going to get into, the ethics of using it and the ethics embedded in it. Uh, what what ethics are we giving this stuff to how it will behave? Our nomination for ethical core instruction for AI is do as librarians do. And I don't think there's a, a better emulation that we could give to these tools than trying to act a, as a way a librarian would, not with no self-interest and in a, in a benevolent uh, fashion. So let's just segue right over to the definition uh, question Riley, and then uh, we'll 
touch on literacy a bit, and then we'll open it up if we have time at the end for questions. So take it away. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, so in one of our sort of first initial meetings about Slate and this project, we were trying to come up with a, a good working definition for our group for AI. And we ran into an interesting issue, which is there's a million of them out there and none of them really suited our purposes. Um, and so we were asking ourselves, why is AI so hard to define? And I think we've touched on a lot of the reasons why already in this talk today, you see AI absolutely everywhere. Not only is it now in PowerPoint and Google Docs and all of these day-to-day -day interactions, but it's in just about every advertisement you see, everyone is talking about AI integration. It's coming to your phone. It's already in social media. Then you inject tools like ChatGPT, MidJourney. So it has a wide variety of uses. It's this brand new technology that can do a wide variety of different things. Um, but it's also become a buzzword that everyone is seeing absolutely every day. Um, and so there's a struggle to really find a good definition that encompasses all of this, because a good definition has to totally cover that, that wide variety of things AI can do today, while also covering what it's likely to be able to do in the future. Like we said, it's an ever-changing technology. It's very, very quickly evolving, and we want a definition that stays relevant. And at the same time, this definition has to be relevant to the average user's experience. These people coming into libraries and asking, what is this technology? You know, I've used it on my phone. I'd see it now in Google Docs. It has to be relevant to what people are experiencing. And so we were thinking to ourselves in this group, how do we tackle this problem? And the obvious answer would seem to be, well, we'll just come up with our own definition. Um, the problem is that is what everyone, everyone else is doing. And it's why we have so many different definitions out there. So what we decided to do is pick a few definitions that we liked and tear them apart figure out what these good definitions had in common and try to define AI by not any specific sentence, not creating a new definition, but finding commonalities between the ones we liked. Um, so a few of these common points we found that I'd, I'd like to just talk about real quick. And, and this is, I will say, the short version of one of the briefings we've posted on the Slate website, if you'd like to go read the full thing. Um, our goal with these briefings is to be able to provide this information, this you know, AI issues that we're thinking about and allow libraries to get ahead of the game on them. Um, so what we found about AI and the definition is that one, it's best understood as a system. Anyone who's on the tech side in here will know that it is a very, very complex, we've mentioned a few of the, the pieces of terminology, machine learning, generative models, um, all of these work together in different ways and in different permutations and combinations of them to make what we know as AI. And so conceptualizing it as a system, not just one specific thing, I think really represents what the technology is. Um, we also wanted to define AI as something that tries to replicate the capabilities of humans in one or more ways. Um, one of the most interesting definitions we found out there was from IBM, who defined AI very succinctly as a technology that attempts to replicate human capacity for thought or for action. Um, and we really like this human-centered approach, because ultimately this is a technology that humans are going to use. Um, if you want to think about this as generative AI replicating human creativity, you can have an argument about that, um, whether that's true or not, but that is sort of the attempt there. And this gives everyone a good frame of reference. Everyone knows what human capacity is, and this allows people, even with no experience with AI, to sort of ground themselves for the definition. Um, we also wanted to touch on the fact that AI systems, like humans, are fallible. There seems to be this widely held perception that AI is infallible or perfectly objective. And, Largely, we can thank science fiction for this, as it's always depicted as this omniscient technology that's gained sentience. And that kind of spills over into people's interactions with it today, that it's somehow going to be perfect and always makes the correct decision. But because it's coded by humans, because it's working on flawed data, and for all these other reasons, it is not infallible. And, and we want to make sure that's in the definition. Um, Finally, we want to touch on the point that AI systems generate outputs that can influence the real and the virtual world. This is really important for these real world applications for what people are seeing every day and how it's affecting their jobs or their everyday lives. Um, it can make things a lot easier. There's certainly a lot of opportunity with AI, 
um, and a lot of danger, but all of that is going to have tangible effects on the world we live in and the virtual world we inhabit. So if you want to read the full version of this, this is on our, our Slate uh, website, which I think is live as of today. Um, but this was sort of our first challenge in this project is, okay, we want to start, we are working with AI, we're looking at all these opportunities and challenges for libraries. And it's difficult to even define it at the beginning, um, which kind of tells you how complex the space is. And, and I think really speaks to the need for projects like this and others to look at AI and, and get libraries out ahead of the issue before people start coming in and asking for all this guidance, um, for all these issues that are going to arise, but also for all the opportunities. Great, great, Riley. Uh, thank you for taking on this uh, very difficult and complex aspect of the project. You think, well, we're just talking about AI. Well, what are we actually talking about? So this is, uh, this is a very uh, challenging thing. I'm going to uh, <clears throat> touch back on, on uh, AI literacy <clears throat> here very quickly. This is this is kind of like the the question about the, what the definition is. Well, what does it mean to be literate? So here here are some things in this uh, Artificial Intelligence Literacy Act, which I wanted to point out, is a proposed bill uh, that's uh, put out there to include AI literacy as part of the Digital Literacy Act. So um, these are reasons or uh, uh, points of interest related to the concept. And, and then the, the uh, act itself, uh, this is another take from Forbes magazine, which is pretty good. I would uh, recommend that article there if anybody uh, wants to dig into this. Well, it's just, it's one of the things that fits into the library uh, uh, service mix of, of literacies from you know, digital and data and media and now AI. So having that structure in existence really gives libraries an advantage uh, as people are trying to figure it out. And the, the reason I think that people are trying to figure this thing out is uh, because uh, it's, <laughs> it's pervasive and, uh, and, and super challenging. So they're looking to libraries indeed as they have. And that then is a... Uh, a new a new opportunity. AI literacy is what's what's different right now is the moment is this is not new stuff. Uh, it's been in the background though. This is embedded in infrastructure and and just in time manufacturing systems and digital financial trading and a lot of research coding. Tremendous amount of. Uh, software coding is done with AI now. So it's it's been around for years and years. What's new is that there's an end user version of AI. This is the chat and the interactive uh, generative programs that we've seen. And that's what's got everybody's attention, that the public is now able to use this stuff for whatever purposes they want. And of course, the background continues to evolve and, and the uh, uh, importance of all that. So this is what's new. This is why there is a, a need for literacy. It's because there's a there's a uh, a public using uh, vehicle to to do that. So we are coming up on our hour. Uh, and David, did you see any more questions that you think we should address here in these last few minutes? Or anything else you want to say about it? Well, thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you by the way, for, for posting the list of the state participants. Uh, everyone, there's a big, a big thank you and a big hats off for these states for stepping forward, you know, stepping into the unknown, as it were, uh, with a, a conversation as opposed to, you know, okay, we're going to have 16 building blocks done at the end of six months. This is uh, these are this is an open project, a conversation. David has said, and and these are the agencies that have stepped up to enter that with a certain amount of courage. I would say, David, uh, I agree. And I, so, uh, less than questions I've seen in the chat. I've just seen thank you all for helping build build the bibliography that's in in process. 
Martha and, and Ray in particular, uh, Ray, I feel I'm going to be knocking on your door to, to help provide some um, academic perspective. Uh, the information literacy uh, academic library perspective will be helpful. And to be really clear, part of our philosophy here is, is we believe in paying for labor, not just getting volunteers to do things. So I want to thank everyone for that, and it's good to see you all. I just really quickly uh, wanted to show you if you're interested in keeping up or playing with the project, we have put together, uh, I put a link in the, the web, which is slate.circle.community, and you'll end up here. Um, and as we you know, hear the briefings that, um, that Riley was talking about, so one on defining, one on corrosive AI, and we'll be adding more as we go through the project. Um, we're building a bibliography right now through Zotero, so you can join that group if you want to keep up with different resources that are being found. Um, I mentioned the idea of getting these real voices within and some of the working group goals. Uh, the other thing I did want to point out, and, and thank you, Don, for pointing, uh, my initial presentation was put together for state libraries, so it did not do what it should have done, which was to, to talk about uh, the support of those. And so under the about, you will get a sense of what it is, the video of the presentation I just gave, our team, and then here are the 14 libraries. Um, Texas State and Georgia uh, were very instrumental in helping to shape this project. I wanna thank all of the state libraries have been um, enthusiastic to be part of this and begin the glance. And so they've been, um, we're looking forward to now working closely as partners in the project um, moving forward. Um, and so we also are looking at are there ways through possibly I'm less funny to extend this to more states, but for now, and we're, we're very open if there are other states that want to join uh, in participating within the service, now is the time. I'm happy to have that conversation. So with that, um, all I can say is this is an important topic. Um, if you look at the Gardner Group, they have something called the hype cycle, which is a take on Everett Rogers' famous diffusion of innovation, which is innovators and early adopters and early majorities, late majorities. Gartner Group talks with technology about a hype cycle which sort of starts murmurs and then suddenly goes to maximum. We're gonna change the entire universe with this, then goes into a trough of disillusionment, which is why did we ever talk about it? And then ends up with a plateau of productivity, which is now we found a use for it. And they put generative AI right at the top of the hype cycle right now, right? The, will it take over the world? Will it change everything? But other AI products, as I mentioned before, using these heuristic and inductive algorithms are now finding their way into all of our systems very much at the plateau of productivity. And we want to look across that band. So now is the time to get involved. As I said, um, what, as we're working on this, the, the products of this will be available. That's part of the circle philosophy, which is we're bringing the group together for a conversation, but the results of that conversation are to inform the whole. Um, I will very much um, would love to have a conversation with Wisconsin. Um, and it, we're here to answer any questions. You get contact information through there and any means of participation. We're looking forward to finding ways in which AI will once again demonstrate the value and importance of libraries and librarianship and librarians, um, but also make sure that our communities are well taken care of and protected as well as being prepared for challenges and opportunities within. Thanks so much for coming today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Don, for putting this together. You've been a fantastic partner to this point. I can't work, can't wait to keep working. Absolutely. And uh, somebody's uh, put their breathing machine on the microphone, but <laughs> so. Uh, yes, I want to reemphasize David's point and uh, making invitation to all state agencies for the for this latest project. You may, if, if you're not a state agency, but a library, you may inquire with your own state agency about their interest in this. And I think it's a it's a valid question. Like, what is your strategy around this? Do you have one? If you don't have one, are you planning to have one? Why don't you have one? Does it make sense to have one? It's, it's just a good conversation to have. And I think that I hope, I'm pretty sure that this project will bring more <clears throat> coherence to the, to the conversation because it, as David pointed out, as Riley mentioned, it's just, it goes in so many different directions. It's really hard to corral the environment. It's like, 
asking a fish about water. You know, it's really difficult for them to answer that for a number of reasons, of course, but one of them is just everywhere. And so uh, I think if we can bring more coherence and some way to understand and approach this, this stuff, uh, then we will have uh, succeeded in this project. And so welcome again, all the agencies that have joined in and David, you just, you're, you're doing a fabulous job getting this thing off the ground. It's so much has happened in just the, the last few weeks. It's just super impressive. And I, I'm, it's, it, we said we were going to start in February. This is February one and we're started. So here we go. Great. Thanks everybody for, for coming uh, and come back. We'll be doing a, an AI session, at least one session every month for the next six months. That'll be sort of at the most general level. And then there'll be individual things that we're doing with the individual agencies and as a work group itself. So there's a lot to do. Let's go do it. So thanks everybody. We're going to stop the recording now.